Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. In this video I will be discussing the first volume of Carl Jung's Black Books, uh, which is this one. So the Black, Black Books, they consist of seven volumes written by Carl Jung between 1913 and 1932. And they were not available to the general public until the end of 2020, when Sonu Shamdasani published an edited edition, including an introduction to the Black, uh, Black Books. And as Sonu Shamdasani also indicated at the back of the book set, they were the most important unpublished works written by Carl Jung uh, up until then. And in this series of seven videos, I will attempt to analyze, summarize and discuss each volume separately. And since the books are rather expensive, I thought it would be interesting to discuss its contents uh, on this YouTube channel, so that among other things, everyone can hopefully understand what these books are all about without having to purchase uh, the entire book set or to read through the entire seven volumes. And I will also make a full review video of the black books as well uh, after finishing all of the volumes. So for me personally, I've des decided to buy the black books because I was really intrigued by the red book. And according to the author, Sono Samdasani, uh, the editor, I'm sorry, uh, only material that was written in the Black Books between 1930 and 1916 were incorporated in the Red Book. And I think that in this sense it is possible to consider the Black Books as an extension of the Red Book. And I've read the Black uh, Red Book multiple times and I'm, you know, I was really eager, eager to continue this journey with Carl Jung. So the first of the seven volumes of the Black Books actually consists of an extensive introduction written by the editor. And the original first volume was written by Carl Jung during his childhood and is therefore also considered to be of less interest to us readers. And as a result, the author editor decided to replace the first volume with an introduction to the black books. And therefore the remaining volumes could maintain their original numbering. So in this first introductionary volume, Sonu Shamdasani elaborated on the events that um, Carl, in, that happened in Carl Jung's life that led up to the creation of the black books and also the writing process of the black books themselves. So prior to World War I um, and before he started writing the black books, Carl Jung had several visions of Europe being flooded by a river of blood. And Carl Jung he actually thought he might be going insane. However, when a war did actually indeed break out, and Europe was flooded by a river of blood, he believed that his visions might have a different origin. And as Sonu Shamdasani indicated as well, in the period, period leading up to the outbreak of World War I, images like those presented to Carl Jung were actually not uncommon in Europe, he wrote. In the years directly preceding the outbreak of war, apocalyptic imagery was widespread in European arts and literature. And as a result, Carl Jung considered the possibility that his images had their origin in a collective unconscious. So the editor wrote, In Jung's view, his undertaking pertained not just to himself, but to others as well. He had come to view his fantasies as stemming from a general metaphoric, metaphoric layer of the psyche, which he named the collective unconscious. So Carl Jung, he stressed how important it was for an individual to become aware of the collective unconscious as well as one's private unconscious. And Carl Jung, he called this process individuation. I've made a separate video about this in the past, which I will link somewhere on your screen. Um, but for now, it's important to note that Carl Jung believed that this process of individuation undertaken on the individual level could have extremely important consequences for entire nations. He believed that the war, so for World War I, revealed to man that he is still brutal, even if he considers himself civilized. And even though the war was fought between nations, it is according to Carl Jung, the reality that the nature of the individual relates to the nature of the nation and vice versa. So he wrote, the psycho psychology of the individual cor corresponds to the psychology of the nation. What the nation does is done also by each individual. And so long as the individual does it, the nation also does it. And as a result, the only way that 
the nation can change, according to Carl Jung, is through changes within the psyche of the individual. He wrote, only the change in the attitude of the individual is the beginning of the change in the psychology of the nation. The great problems of humanity will never be solved through general laws, but always only through the renewal of the attitude of the individual. And in the introduction to the black books, uh, Sunu Shamdasani observed as well that Carl Jung argued that after the French Revolution, people became more skeptical towards religions and other ideas uh, that were considered irrational. As a result, Carl Jung believed that these irrational ideas had remained suppressed for too long and eventually the suppression culminated in the outbreak of World War I. And as a result, the editor wrote, It was thus a historical necessity to acknowledge the irrational as a psychological factor. The acceptance of the irrational forms one of the central undertakings in the black books. In this regard, Carl Jung also believed that symbols are of extreme importance. And this is the case because these symbols serve as a bridge to the unconscious world and thereby, thereby creates room for the irrational. So Nusham Dasani noted that Symbols, he argued, so Carl Jung, stemmed from the unconscious, and the creation of symbols was the most important function of the unconscious. While the compensatory function of the unconscious was always present, the symbol-creating function was only present when we were willing to recognize it. The Red Book, as well as the Black Books, were, as observed by Sono Shamdasani, an attempt by Carl Jung to explore this power of the symbol-creating function which is present within every individual. And as I've also mentioned in previous videos, Carl Jung argued that there exist two dimensions in this two dimensions in this world, the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths. And according to the editor, Carl Jung saw it as his, as his task to translate what he learned from the exploration of the spirit of the depths into the language of the spirit of the times. And throughout the process of writing the black books and the self-exploration that was necessary to do so, Carl Jung came to realize that the goal of this process was the development of the self. The realization was that the self was the goal of the process of individuation. Progression was not linear, but involved the circumambulation of the self. And although, as I also mentioned in a previous post uh, and video, Carl Jung called the entirety of an individual's personality, the combination of the conscious personality, uh, the ego and the unconscious personality, the self. And in order to reach this goal of the development of the mature self, Carl Jung believed that every individual must go through several stages of exploration. Uh, one had to explore the personal un uh, unconscious, integrate one's anima or animus, and also explore the collective unconscious. And in order to integrate these aspects of the self and thereby develop a mature self, Carl Jung argued that one might engage in inner dialogues through, for example, active imagination. Everyone, he claimed, had this ability to hold dialogues with himself, with him or herself. Active imagination would thus be one form of inner dialogue, a type of dramatized thinking. And this would result in the establishment of a form of communication between the conscious and unconscious forces. The exploration of the unconscious world would result in a mature self and this in turn was, according to Carl Jung, the ultimate goal of life as well, because it is the fullest expression of the unique individual. The self is also the goal of life, because it is the most complete expression of that fateful combination we call individuality. If the experiencing of the self as something irrational, as an indefinable being to which the I is neither opposed nor subjected, but in a relation of dependence and around which it revolves, very much as the earth revolves around the sun, then the goal of individ individuation has been reached. And at the end of the first introductory volume, Sonu Shamdasani shared with us what he believed we could learn from the black books. He indicated that the Black Books offer a unique insight into the, in the development of the thoughts and ideas of one of the most important psychologists to have ever lived. And Carl Jung, by writing the Black, black Books, attempted to connect with his own self, but also illustrated how every individual 
could do so as well. As a document, domain, document domain and psychological records, the black books chart Jung's attempt to resolve the 20th century crisis of meaning in his own person and distill from this a meaning through psychotherapy for our others to do likewise. So the black books as well as the red book form in the words of Sono Shandasani, the core of analytical psychology and enable its historical genesis, genesis to be studied from its inception. And Friedrich Nietzsche, through his character Zarathustra, announced the death of God. And Carl Jung, through his writings in the Red Book and the Black Books, portrayed the rebirth of God within the soul. Whereas Zarathustra procla proclaims the death of God, Libra Novos depicts the rebirth of God in the soul. So yeah, thank you for watching. And that was just the discussion of the first volume. So if you're also interested in the following volumes, then please also consider subscribing to this YouTube channel as well. So thank you very much and I hope to see you in the next video.